Hey, thank you all for coming. It's a rainy night out there, as I found out the hard way. I'm going to give you some a short opening remarks and leave plenty of time for questions. I'd like to thank the folks for C-SPAN for being here today and filming us. I just returned from an economics conference in Italy. One of the sessions was a mock trial in which the economists of the world were put on trial accused of completely missing the warning signs of the current crisis, not predicting it, doing nothing to prevent it, and thus far doing little to help enact smart reforms to end it. I had to give a talk on my book at the same time as the mock trial across town in Italy, but I didn't want to miss it, so I sent Roberto Peretti, the chief prosecutor of the trial and himself a top economist, the following memo. It was entitled Witness for the Prosecution, and it read as follows. Roberto, I see you are speaking at noon today as the prosecutor asking whether economists are to blame for the current financial crisis. I wanted to attend, but I'm speaking at the same time across town on my new book. I wish you success with your prosecution, and although I generally am against the death penalty, I think I would make an exception in this case. Your prosecution reminds me of a story I heard about John McKay, the first coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who unfortunately went zero wins and 16 losses in their first season of pro football. In the locker room after the last game, Coach McKay was asked by a journalist what he thought about the execution of his team on the field, and McKay said he was all in favor of it. <laughs> I did have one question, Roberto, I wish you would ask during your prosecution. Could you ask whether the defense believes that professors of finance, economics, option theory, and derivatives were conflicted in writing and discussing about the potential for a crisis given that these same professors were earning hundreds of thousands of dollars from our biggest banks and hedge funds in the form of speaking engagement fees, honorariums, expert witness fees in trials, and consulting and business partners partnerships with some of the worst offenders on Wall Street. Today, I want to address the real causes of this crisis, because if we don't get that right, there is little chance Obama's suggested reforms will be effective in either ending the crisis or preventing something like this from occurring in the future. And to those of you who believe the crisis is over, I have some swampland in Florida I would like to sell you. First, I would like to caution you against believing those with very simple, easy to understand explanations. This crisis is very complicated, and unfortunately, some of our brightest are saying some of the stupidest stuff about what caused this mess. You have Alan Greenspan and other defenders of completely unregulated markets suggesting that such a downturn is normal, that it is part of a normal business cycle, that it was completely unavoidable, arguing that it was almost like an act of God, as random and unpredictable and natural as a hundred-year flood to use Greenspan's language. There is nothing normal about what the world is experiencing today. To suggest otherwise smacks of a let them eat cake elitism that shows that Alan Greenspan is far removed from the actual pain and suffering the crisis is causing the average American family. Similarly, be suspicious of those who try to blame capitalism generally for this crisis. Capitalism has done more to create growth and reduce poverty and inequality in the world than any economic system in the history of the world. Let's be careful not to throw out our baby capitalism with the bathwater. Global capitalism knows no country borders and recognizes no national boundaries, so it is not surprising that it has helped just working. It is not surprising that it has helped the poorest of the world in China and India and Asia the most in escaping poverty, even if it meant greater hardship to the middle class in U.S. and Europe. 
But if you look past nationality, what is wrong with helping the poorest of the world first? Finally, always hold last as an explanation of a situation you don't completely understand an accusation that those who participated in or caused the crisis were somehow irrational or even stupid. I worked with these folks on Wall Street for 10 years, and I can promise you there are many things, but they are not stupid. Similarly, to blame the crisis on Wall Street by calling Wall Streeters greedy, to me, seems to miss the point. Greed is what Wall Street does, and has always done. There is no Wall Street without greed. Why else would someone watch, watch his life disappear as he watched a 19-inch computer screen only to grab a morsel or crumb of profit and try to get rich off it? Greed has been in our genes for hundreds of thousands of years. The genes have not mutated suddenly in the last 30 years to make us more greedy. And to those behavioral economists out there who are quick to accuse others of irrational behavior, I can think of no greater public pronouncement of your own inability to identify the two true causes of this problem than trying to label all those around you as irrational. It is a very dangerous game you are playing because it lays the seeds of an argument that says what we need is greater protection from our irrational selves. And who is always there to offer this service? An elite class of bureaucrats who pretend to know more about what makes me happy than I know myself. If behaviorists are ever able to prove that markets or most of their participants are irrational, it will be a very sad day for those of us who love and hold dear our individual freedom, our individual choice, and our basic rights as humans. If the key participants in the current financial crisis were irrational, please help me identify who it was that was irrational. Who are we talking about? Was it the home buyer's real estate agent? who was earning twenty to fifty thousand dollar commissions with no risk but only if his or her client was the winning buyer do you see why it was in their interest to get their buyers to bid more not less certainly unethical and unprofessional but not irrational from their perspective were the vast number of financial middlemen irrational from the appraisers putting out crazy high appraisals for a fee to the rating agencies who were paid billions of dollars to call junk securities AAA, to the congressmen who took bribes to loosen industry regulation, to the investment bankers who were paid hundreds of billions to peddle this stuff, to the mortgage brokers who falsified mortgage applications to guarantee approval. Again, highly unethical and in some cases completely criminal, but not irrational. What about the home buyer himself? Certainly he was irrational to pay 50 to 60 percent premiums more than a home's true worth. But what if I told you that most of these home buyers were playing with other people's money? That they had borrowed all the money they needed at 2 to 3 percent with no down payment of their own funds? Certainly a terrible way to arrive at the fair price for a home, but such a buyer would be motivated to buy the biggest home he could as he would want to maximize his upside profit in a booming market. <clears throat> he would be insensitive to price, as he knew he would enjoy all of the upside, but if the market turned south, he could avoid any loss by allowing the bank to take the property back in foreclosure. Sounds pretty rational to me. If the borrower is getting such a sweet deal, surely the lender, his commercial banker, was acting irrationally in giving him the loan. But the world of commercial banking has changed dramatically in the last 25 years. Banks today don't sit on most loans they make. They securitize them and sell them upstream, upstream to big principal investors. Like pension funds, sovereign governments, municipalities, and insurance companies. The, the commercial banker has few rational reasons to care about the quality of the loan he has created. If it defaults, he won't lose anything. We now know that some of these banks did indeed position some of this toxic waste on their own balance sheets, and their losses turned out to be huge, <clears throat> excuse me, large enough to bankrupt many of these firms. Sounds pretty stupid, doesn't it? 